Hi everybody, price discrimination occurs when a firm charges different prices to different consumers for an identical good or service with no differences in costs of production. Learn that definition in those four key ways and you'll get it right every time. So there might be a person who's maybe charged four pounds for a good or service, but then there's somebody else for an identical good or service for no differences in costs of production is charged let's say 12 pounds. That sounds really dodgy, right? Well, how on earth can a firm get away with doing something like that? Well, there are three conditions necessary for a firm to be able to price discriminate. First of all, they've got to have some kind of price making ability, the ability to set prices. And for that, they need monopoly power, some kind of legal monopoly power. They need to have information to be able to separate the market into different PEDs, separate and identify different consumers via price elasticity of demand. So for example, they need to be able to identify groups of consumers with price inelastic demand so they can charge higher prices, but also identify consumers with price elastic demand where they can charge lower prices and thus are able to maximize their profits in the process. But for that, they need information. And have you guys noticed that whenever we do our shopping online, these firms want us to create accounts. Well, why? because then they can track what we do. They can collect information and therefore segment us into different markets based on our PED. But also firms have got to be able to prevent resale of a good. They've got to stop somebody buying from where the price is lower and selling where the price is higher. Otherwise, there's nothing good for the firm. It's gonna reduce profits for the firm. So they've got to be able to prevent resale like that. We call that market seepage. So preventing that is also important. There are three different degrees of price discrimination. Let's look at the first degree. First degree price discrimination is really dodgy. It occurs when consumers are charged the exact price they are willing and able to pay for a good or service, therefore eroding all consumer surplus in the market and turning it into monopoly profit. Really, really dodgy stuff here. So we take a normal market like this, we've got a demand curve. At a price of P1, consumer surplus would be this triangle here the area above the price line and beneath the demand curve. That would be the consumer surplus, but not if a firm is using first degree price discrimination. All of this consumer surplus would be turned into monopoly profit, and we can write that down here. So consumer surplus, consumer surplus is now turned into monopoly profit as consumers are charged the exact price they're willing and able to pay for a good or service. Incredible to think this can happen, but again, if firms have got good information about us, by all means, they can do something like this. Now let's look at second degree price discrimination. There are many ways to look at second degree price discrimination. One way I'm going to look at it is with excess capacity pricing. This is when you have a firm with fixed capacity. So take a train company, an airline company, fixed number of seats. You've got a cinema, a theater, sports uh, venue. A hotel is a really good example with fixed number of rooms where it makes no sense to leave any of that capacity idle. Why? Because these companies have got fixed costs they need to pay. So maybe what these guys do is last minute they lower their prices in order to fill that capacity and contribute towards their fixed costs. You can consider this as last minute deals and we can illustrate that on a diagram. Uh, let's take an example of a rail company or an airline company. Marginal cost curve will look something like this. So horizontal up to a point, and that point is their capacity. So let's call that Q cap. It's logical to see that beyond Q cap, you can't produce anything more. So the marginal cost curve, the supply curve becomes vertical to represent that. But beneath Q cap, we have a horizontal marginal cost curve. So if we take the example of, a, of an airline, we can see that marginal cost is constant when it comes to filling one more seat on the plane. The extra cost is simply maybe a meal you have to provide for that person, the admin involved with sorting out the ticketing, the check-in process, the cost is always const constant. The same uh, argument applies whether it's a rail company, whether it's a hotel, we're assuming constant marginal cost here. Revenue curves look just as normal. So we have AR that looks like that. We have MR which is twice as steep. So assuming this firm is a profit maximizer, they're gonna produce where MC equals MR. That gives us quantity Q1. Reading the price of the AR curve, we get a price of P1. Great, and that'll be maximizing profits for this firm. But we can see that if they maximize profits like this, 
there is going to be some excess capacity left, the difference between QCAP and Q1. And it makes no sense to leave that idle given the fixed costs that exist, whether you're a hotel, whether you're an airline, whatever. You've got fixed costs you need to pay here. So what a firm might do is lower their prices to make sure that they can uh, fill all of that capacity and thus bring in revenue to contribute towards their fixed costs. And the logical place to go and price is here at price P2. At price P2, you can see that all the capacity is going to be filled and the revenue coming in can be used to contribute towards paying off fixed costs of the hotel, of the airline company, of the rail company, whatever. And you can see that by doing so, the consumers that are able to buy last minute here at a lower price gain consumer surplus. So consumers that pay the lower price for this excess capacity benefit from a gain of consumer surplus of this triangle here. So that's the gain of consumer surplus. So I'll say the gain of consumer surplus for those consumers who pay the lower price for that excess capacity, that last minute deal. And no doubt a lot of us have benefited from such last minute deals like this. And it makes sense for the firm to do so. So that's a nice diagram for you to use to show second degree price discrimination. Uh, not all bad news in this case, some consumers benefit. Let's now move on and look at third degree price discrimination. Third degree price discrimination occurs when a firm is able to segment the market into different price elasticities of demand. So there'll be one group of consumers with price inelastic demand, one group of consumers with price elastic demand. A firm will recognize that, maybe based on time differences, maybe based on age, income or geography, and therefore will charge different prices to those different groups. So let's take an example of a rail company. A rail company has identified different groups of consumers, consumers with inelastic demand, i.e. those commuters who need to get to work, and those with more price elastic demand, leisure travelers. The marginal cost curve for the rail company, let's assume, is constant, just like we argued before. So we'll say it's constant across both market segments here. So we take that across and we'll just call that the marginal cost for the same reason we argue it as before and that is to fill one more seat on the train the cost is the same each time okay so constant marginal cost here right we need to draw our revenue curves well our demand curve our ar curve if demand is price inelastic is going to be quite steep whereas here it's going to be more shallow so let's make that clear let's say demand is going to look something like that so there's ar which is demand mr is going to be twice as steep as that and over here, much more shallow. So let's say AR is equal to demand, looks something like that, and MR twice as steep, something like that. So there's the different price elasticities of demand. Uh, here, the peak consumers, and here, the off-peak consumers when it comes to using rail. Well, what's a firm gonna do? They're gonna profit maximize in each case, charging and producing what MC equals MR. So let's take MC equals MR in both cases. Well, that's here. Let's call that quantity Q1. They're going to read the price off the AR curve. That's going to take us to here. Let's call that price P1. Let's do the same thing over here. So MC equals MR is over there. Call that quantity Q2. The price read off the AR curve, call it P2. And we can see very clearly the different prices being charged in the different markets depending on PEDs. Naturally, where demand is more price inelastic, the peak consumers, prices are going to be much higher to exploit the fact that demand is price inelastic. Whereas where demand is more price elastic, prices are lower. And we can see that instead of just charging one price overall in the market, by charging two prices, this firm is able to maximize their joint profits. We can see that if they charge P1 across in this market, there'll be no demand at all. So by being able to charge different prices to different consumers because of differing PEDs, this firm is able to maximize their joint profits. Um, so this is third degree price discrimination here, segmenting the market based on different PED values. Let's wrap up now and look at the pros and cons of price discrimination. It seems logical to start with the cons. The biggest con by far is the allocative inefficiency of a price discriminating firm. This is a real, real problem. Charging prices way beyond marginal cost, exploiting consumers drastically. Look at first degree price discrimination. Look at the price inelastic market segment of third degree price discrimination. This is really horrible news for consumers being exploited with such high prices. But also the inequalities that come. Again, first degree price discrimination, the inelastic market segment of third degree price discrimination. Who are those consumers? If those consumers are those on lower incomes, it can really widen income inequality in society. And also the anti-competitive nature of pricing. This really comes down to third degree price discrimination and looking at what's happening in the more price elastic market segment here. 
and saying, well, if prices are driven down there, if those lower prices are driving out competitors, then this firm is going to be left with pure monopoly power. We don't want that at all. That could be very anti-competitive. There are some pros with price discrimination. We could argue with greater profits made by the firm, there might be more reinvestment potential and greater dynamic efficiency benefits. We know about dynamic efficiency well by now. With greater quantity, think about higher quantity in both second degree and third degree price discrimination. There could be greater economies of scale benefits and maybe in the future lower prices to consumers over time. Some consumers do benefit from price discrimination in second degree, yes, and in third degree, think about those in the price elastic uh, market segment here. Some consumers do benefit, but nowhere near uh, as much benefit as consumers that lose as a result of price discrimination. So don't be thinking this is a great thing, consumers win or anything like that. Only some consumers might benefit. And cross-subsidization benefits. So the higher profits that firms make might be used to cross-subsidize uh, loss-making goods or services elsewhere in the business, allowing those to still function and be provided to consumers. But don't look at this, guys, and think, oh, more pros than cons. Absolutely not. Just because there might be more pros and cons here, that con here outweighs any of the pros that you might think. This is really bad for consumers as price discrimination. So don't be thinking it's, it's more good than bad. This con needs to be weighed up significantly and it's a real issue. So that's it with price discrimination, guys. It's a really weighty topic area. Very, very useful for you to know this information in an essay. Thanks for watching. Really hope you found that interesting. I'll see you all in the next video. Mm -hmm.